Artist at the Abramtsova Art Colony, which will be the topic for next week, for next week, next uh, month, October. For the National Style Seekers, art reflected a commitment to the revival of a traditional indigenous heritage of Russia in place of Western alternatives imposed by Peter the Great and his reforms, and a creation of a new style with a national identity. By new was meant one which looked back to the pre-Petrine period. By new, yes. This new art form was to reflect a national identity based on what was considered traditional, founded on Byzantine and Slavic sources. Medieval art and the Russian peasant were seen as a repository of the native Russian tradition. Now, my first lecture, which is today's, presents the developments of art movements leading up to the formation of the Russian art with national identity. The second lecture discusses the revival and cultivation of peasant arts and contribution of Abramtseva art colony to the development of a specifically Russian art. For the most part of the 19th century, the search for Russian art with a national identity was foremost on the mind of Russian thought. Since the War of 1812, which unified Russians from all strata of society for a common cause. The need for the art form based on traditional sources was becoming increasingly more apparent. Contemporary social and political issues in their impact upon Russian society led not only toward an identity crisis, but towards a reassessment of Russia's role and contribution to the world art arena. The preoccupation of leading patrons, artists, and critics with the cultivation of a new national style was supported by the Slavophile movement, thanks to which there was a growing interest in Russian history and also the Orthodox Church and its heritage. Art history as a discipline was also establishing itself with an interest in medieval Russia and native peasant decorative arts. Of significance was the emancipation of the serf in 1861 by Tsar Liberator Alexander II. The events leading up to this were very intense and the new social and economic issues it unleashed. It introduced a mobile agrarian population which with rapid industrialization was gradually moving into the cities. This led eventually to depopulation of villages, gradually that is, and threatened with the loss of traditional peasant way of life and of course along with that the arts and crafts. Some from this population upon contact with industrialization formed a new class, the bourgeoisie. An art acquired a new patron, a new collector, a literary critic and artist. The effect of rapid industrialization was partially countered by a rise in interest among the intelligentsia of Russia's pre-Petrine historic past and the peasant arts and crafts with a concern for its preservation. There was a deep felt desire to retain the fast disappearing national elements of their heritage. Several external factors could have compounded with these intrinsic issues and contributed to the historical awareness of one's own culture. The principle of the arts and crafts movement of William Morris in England, that art should affect all aspects of life, could have nurtured this social consciousness for the preservation and conservation of the traditional peasant way of life and their arts, which industrialization was dooming to extinction. If art should affect all aspects of life, then peasant art was a living example of what William Morris believed the function of art should be. And this will be relevant when we, um, when I discuss in uh, the following lecture in October, when I talk about Abramtseva, because one of the members of Abramtseva circle was actually familiar with some of the members from the William Morris group. 
the Russian peasant emerged as a repository of native Russian tradition, lost to the westernizing reforms of Peter I and then Catherine II. What were the salient features of this native Russian peasant art? And how were they manifested in art? I thought of Kandinsky. Kandinsky, the Russian abstract expressionist, in his reminiscences, where he writes about his travels in rural Russia, describes the aesthetic experience in visiting peasant izbaz houses and churches. Upon entering the room and the Kremlin churches, I felt myself surrounded on all sides by painting, into which I had thus penetrated full immersion. The Tsirin Palace, Moscow Kremlin, the Golden Room, Kandinsky's description certainly applies equally to his experience of the peasant Izba as it does to the palace, illustrated here in the PowerPoint by the 17th century, it's the Tienin Palace and the Moscow Kremlin. Interior of Dormition Cathedral, Moscow Kremlin. The same effect, considered Kandinsky felt, painted interiors of Kremlin cathedrals shared with folk art. Immersion into a painted interior in peasant art was entirely decorative and aesthetic. Within the Orthodox Church, it had a different function in addition to that. Its decorative program created a microscopic version of the divine order of the universe into which the beholder was meant to enter. It was a spiritual realm where techniques rendering the illusion of the three-dimensional physical world, corporal world, didn't exist, but were replaced by those best used to represent the world, the world of the spirit, where, as Lazarev, the Russian art historian, put it, everything, the composition, linear rhythm, sense for the contour of figures, color, and perspective is subordinated to the principal idea, the spirit. This is an icon of St. George. It's from the Novgorod school, dates to the second half of the 15th century illustrates well how the medieval artist restricted the composition to the flat surface of the panel. I often use in my lectures the term dematerializing form. In other words, making it appear less three-dimensional, not corporal, not physical, not belonging to the three-dimensional world we live in, and denied the illusion of receiving space. This same aesthetic characterized peasant art to a degree. Elena Palenova, one of the leading promoters of peasant arts revival at Abramtseva, whom we will, you will hear about her a lot more next lecture, believed that the remote villages and monasteries were rich repositories of the living native tradition. And that is where she, she searched, and along with others, for inspiration. Then we come to this, Karl Brulov, Last Days of Pompeii. Aesthetic appeal of native Russian art was lost in the mainstream of westernized Russia, westernized by Peter and his successor, Catherine II. She founded the Academy of Art in St. Petersburg with curriculum modeled on the Western European prototype and initially staffed by foreign instructors. This altered the course of Russian art for the next several centuries. Karol Brulov, Brulov in the last days of Pompeii follows prescribed academic canons of idealized Greco-Roman historical subjects, painted in an 18th century neoclassical style. A canvas with a smooth surface, devoid of the expressive gesture of the brush. That was very important. You didn't feel the signature of the artist, the temperament of the artist. Plenty of nudes, those we have here, and draped figures based on Greco-Roman classical sculpture, theatrically staged in a pyramid composition 
painted with techniques to render the illusion of a three-dimensional world. Techniques like a linear perspective to suggest illusion of depth, chiaroscuro, modeling through light and contrast of light and shadow to suggest a three-dimensional volume of a figure, sfumato, blurring of contour, muting of colors at the horizon to suggest depth and space. Not surprisingly, therefore, this painting commissioned by Anatoly Zimidov, a very well-known Russian collector and patron of the arts, won instant European fame for the artist when exhibited in Italy, in Milan, and France, in Paris, in 1834. However, this classical subject matter was far removed from Russian reality and their interest except for, a few, for the few. Livitsky, Dimitri, portrait of Catherine II. Grand Manor portraits were just the thing for promotion of prestige, role, and status of the sitters. Here we see Catherine II in an audacious display of power. Academic classicism pervades this painting, not only in pose, assumed by the ruler, which evokes classical Greek representation of goddesses the goddesses tended to be nude. But the interpretation of the scene within the classical context, a classical temple dedicated to the goddess of justice, by inference referring to Catherine. Baradikovsky, portrait of Prince Alexander Kurakin. Interpretation, composition, and technique of execution of this grand manner portrait of Kurakin follows rules prescribed by the academy. He is shown in full splendor of a statesman and diplomat at the height of his career. Traditional reference to classical architecture of the column seen in the background, the sumptuous red drape made of luxurious and expensive material, medals, the honors, and the bust of the emperor. On the far right, if you see it, it's a bit dark, but Paul the first, whose reign he served, in whose reign he served, all bear witness to his brilliant career and achievements. Kamyakov, you can spell it with a K-H, uh, I think H-O-M-Y-A-K-O uh, does, is a good way to spell it, I prefer that. Voices rose though against the wholesale westernization of Russian culture. And development developed into a national movement. By 1840s, the Slavophile movement was advocating against these influences and values at the expense of a unique Russian cultural heritage. And of course, that affects both literature, arts. Its ideology took shape in the early 19th century and is attributed to a religious writer and philosopher, Alexei Kamikov. You see him here in his self-portrait. He painted this work. Central to this philosophy, oh, and in addition, uh, also a very important literary critic, Ivan Kievsky. Central to this philosophy was the role of the Eastern Orthodox Church in world peace. Peace in the world could only be achieved through an inner transformation of each individual. individual. This will, in fact, also influence Dostoevsky. His thought. Vasily Pirov, very well-known realist um, artist painting in the realistic style. Pyotr Dostoevsky is represented here in this portrait by Pirov. And he, this right, the writer, uh, was a leading supporter of the Pochveniki, an offshoot of the Slavophile movement which shared Slavophile philosophy of a purely Russian identity, which was tied to the Orthodox Church, but accepted reforms of Peter I. These two movements then were countered. They were countered by the Zapadniki movement in favor of assimilation of Western values and destiny to the expense of Russia's native heritage. Painting and literature shared comparable concern and social issues in the 1860s. Both Dostoevsky and Pirov, the artist of this portrait, touched upon sore contemporary issues, with the difference that Dostoevsky offered a solution, 
a solution through inner transformation of his heroes, while Pierrot simply pointed out the problems. Lupki, plural, Lubok, singular. This one's titled Barber Cutting Beard of Old Believer. The peasant emerged as a living repository, gradually, of the aesthetic ideal of forgotten imagery. Once Russia was inspired to appreciate her own indigenous culture, the continuity of the living peasant arts offered the key to the aesthetic ideal of forgotten and rejected images. It was the peasant who preserved the spirit of the indigenous pre petrine traditions of Russian culture, the icon, the book, wood carving, decorative applied arts, the oral literary tradition of the ballad, bulini, fairy tale, and folk song. And in fact, uh, when, we, when I present the lecture next month, uh, we will talk about uh, wood prints, woodblock prints uh, made by Palianova, whom I've already mentioned, um, and also her efforts in going to the villages to record the folk songs and the fairy tales and the Bellini. Their genius for wood carving was sustained through the arts and crafts, which were part of every village household and church interior. Now the Lubok, plural from, uh, Lubki is plural for Lubok, is a woodblock print and they were cheap, easily available and decorated not only peasant houses, they were very popular among Tsars, by the way, they collected them, and nobility. The term Lubok derives its name from Lub, the carvable inner bark of a linden tree on which woodblock was engraved and then it was painted with ink, which was a mixture of soot and burnt sienna, dissolved in boiled linseed oil. Coloring of the prints was an, with natural dyes became a village affair. Everyone gathered to do that. Initially, these were biblical in content. The earliest dating to about 1625 was printed for the Orthodox clergy of the Monastery of the Caves in Kiev. By, by, but by the end of the 17th century, they became secular in content and cover a very, very large uh, array of subject matter from folk tales, proverbs, heroic epics, retelling newspaper articles, novels and poems by favorite, um, usually favorite, famous Russian authors like Pushkin, like uh, Lermontov, Vogel, and foreign novels as well, and foreign poetry as well. They were also an important educational tool and was used extensively to teach children to read. They were satirical often and quite humorous with a keen political or social commentary, like this one. Satirizing Peter the Great and his modernizing efforts this one refers to Peter's decree of, um, of against wearing beards, which I think is very explicit here. Now, I apologize, this one is a bit blurry, but that's, um, you know, I had a black and white, it wasn't blurry, but I thought this color, um, the one in color was a better one, but it is blurry, but I apologize. This loop book illustrates a folk tale, the story uh, of which is the following. Once upon a time, a cat, a cat pretended to be dead, and mice decided to give him a proper burial. On the way to the graveyard, the cat jumped up and ate the entire funeral procession. Not surprisingly, the picture appeared soon after Peter's death. The cat caricatures Peter and personifies him, while many of the mice bear a resemblance to Peter's associates. The pole bear and mice represent the territories Peter won from Swedes. And the pipe, and that's in the upper right hand um, area. And cabriolet symbolize modernization of Russia, while which Vasily Korin, and that's the artist, uh, being an old believer, was not in favor of. 19th century, just to give you a kind of a flavor, 19th century peasant house window frame, you can see it on the left, and then 19th century house in Konstramskaya region built by a peasant in uh, also in the 19th century. 
Yelena Palenova, in her work at the Bramtsova Estate Carpentry Workshop, commented on the predisposition she observed among the peasants for carving and working in wood. It was a natural form of art for each peasant boy she employed at the carpentry workshop, and each youth organically responded to it and produced it well. She therefore considered it to be a living form of art, relevant to them, passed on from father to son and so on, which was still relevant to them. The peasant therefore provided a continuum necessary for the preservation of the natural form of art. This is a good example. The Transfiguration Church Kizhi in the northern part of Russia, 1714, the artist is architect is Nesta. The Transfiguration Church at Kizhi bears witness to this genius in wood working. It's a five-tiered summer church. Summer because it, it's not insulated, so it certainly wasn't um, conducive to service in the winter. And it was made by a peasant by the name of Nesta, who fashioned the 22 cupolas, and I'm showing you a close-up here as well, out of 30,000 aspen plates, which he carved with an ax without the use of a single nail. Trepinin. Vasily Trepinin self-portrait. Moscow, it was Moscow in the first half of the 19th century, which emerged as a driving force in the search for this identity. The Moscow Church of Pain, uh, School of Painting was the antithesis of St. Petersburg Academy in its democratic ethos and sympathy with realism, realism as a, as, as a style in painting, and preference for depiction of Russian middle-class life and also of the peasant. This tendency towards genre, by genre I mean depiction of scenes of everyday life, would have been supported by a very large merchant class in Moscow. Vasily Trepinin was a founder in 1840 of the Moscow School of Painting. He, along with others, but he was one of the leading figures there, he is particularly known for paintings of subjects shown in familiar Russian settings. In his self-portrait, we see the artist standing in the upper floor studio, overlooking the Kremlin in the distance. It certainly gives us a location. We know where he is. The painting exudes Moscovite intimacy and preference for realism and a mixture of both private and public life of the artist. The composition mix mimics the grand manner portrait, yet the casualness in comportment, pose, clothing, familiar surroundings replace the strict academic formality of grand manner portraiture. Fyodotov. Fyodotov's genre scenes are full of biting, uh, biting sarcasm, if you wish, satirical comment, but they're humorous. And they were a major source of inspiration for Trepinin. Hedotov was not only an artist, but he was a musician and producer of plays. He often turned to plays based on writings by Russian um, author Gogol for ideas on subjects to paint. And with humor and wit comparable to that of the writer, addressed avarice and hypocrisy. He combines tragic and comic in his work of this painting titled Newly Decorated, whose perception of the significance of his newly acquired position is truly comical, considering its worth is only a medal, to which his mistress or perhaps cook or both, points irreverently with her shoe. The uselessness of the metal and overblown self-worth is tragic in the context of poverty and total waste that we find in his flat. Veneziano. Well, I'm, partial, I'm very partial to this artist. He's one of my favorites. Uh, Alexei Veneziano. On the harvest, obviously summer, mid-1820s, 
Venetianov introduces romanticized versions of the Russian peasant in a native landscape setting, a place of his labor. Rural scenes soon begin to dominate Russian genre painting. Moscow School of the Arts, because of its democratic ethos, included a high percentage of raznachintsi. The word derives as a combination of two Russian words, raznian meaning different and chin meaning rank. So it's people of different social rank, among which were merchants, bourgeois, lesser bureaucrats, clergy, peasants, who had a less significant chance of an education before, but by second half of the 19th century had access to universities and academies and constituted a special strata of Russian society, which will be referred to as intelligentsia. Vinitsiana, in the rank of a civil servant, was educated as a draftsman and a surveyor. He becomes an artist, and later he founds a regional school of the arts, of painting specifically, on his estate in the region, the province of Tsideg, which is west of Moscow, with predominantly a peasant student body. Venetianov's romantic type of painting, and this one in particular, is characterized by its rural subject, emphasis on the peasant, with an innovative modern constructive space. The construction of the space is truly modern. The harvest captures the expansive space in, of the vast land, which is a major Russian theme. He includes another quality, which is also seen in Russian icon painting, an atmosphere of timelessness, a stillness, as if time has stopped, and you enter a state of suspension of time in harmony with nature. His approach to space and perspective is indeed modern. The scene expands beyond the confines of the, can of, of the canvas, with lack of what is referred to as repoussoir elements. In other words, in the foreground, on the right, and on the left, there are no objects, there are no trees, no bushes, there's nothing there to return you back to the painting. Your eye wanders off, spreads across. Maria, know, Maria, away. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you briefly, this is Bettina. Yes. But there is some kind of high-pitched Yes, I know it's my computer because I think it's getting uh, heated. It's hot. And it's the fan going. Does it make a high pitch? Because we're hearing a high pitch. It's not a high pitch as when I'm hearing it. It's just, I can hear the fan, but it's not high. So I don't know what to do with it. But it's just cooling off. My uh, computer needs to cool off. OK. Is it intolerable? Or, you know, I don't know. I don't I, I'm not sure what it is for others. I was just interrupting briefly to see if we could solve it. I don't know that we can. I don't think you can because it is, um, it tends to do that when it's on for a long time. Can okay. you situate your computer so that there's air circulating underneath? Um, well, it does have, move it out. <clears throat> that stopped it. Did it? Oh, it's much softer. It's softer. Okay, good, good. Then this is a good, all right. As long as it helps. So it's, that's better. Okay, so. Better, good. Okay, as long as it's better. We all shall right. carry on. Everyone mute okay. if you can. Vinitiana's romantic type of painting. This, I'm, I'm already, okay, let's see, where am I? His approach to space and perspective is quite modern then. And so your eye does not, and there's nothing to prevent the eye from spreading horizontally and out of the painting. He arranges his background in strips rising across the surface of the painting, a technique later to be used by impressionists. You know, you notice, for example, the terrace that she sits on, then you have the green, then you have the gold, and then again the green, then again the gold, then again the green, they're all horizontal like strips. And they seem to stack up on the surface of the painting rather than the artist using linear perspective to take you towards the horizon. 
it's just, it's a modern form, modern way of dealing with space. Grigori Soroka was one of his pupils and uh, he was his most talented uh, pupil. View of Lake Boldino, and this lake uh, is on um, Veneziano's estate, was painted by his talented pupil. And he is, Soroka is known for his luminous effect. And luminism, it's, um, it's a technical term used in art history. It deals with reflective light, light that reflects on glass-like surface of water. And it's painted all plan air, which, well, which probably many of you know, means outdoors. So there's a real careful observation of light uh, which occurs while the artist is out of doors, painting out of doors. Now we come to a very important artist. Uh, this one is Ivan Klemskoy, not that any of the others are not important, but I Ivan Klemskoy, within some 20 years, the unquestionable authority of St. Petersburg Academy of Art will be challenged, and it will be challenged by this man. I show you two portraits. One is a self-portrait of the young artist. The other one is by Yaroshenka of the mature Hemsworth. He's a very gifted artist. And in his final year, diploma year, he's ready to graduate. He, he in a bold political gesture for reform, leads 14 students in his final year refusing to paint the obligatory diploma painting on traditionally assigned mythological scenes, demanding they be given freedom of choice of subject. Well, this launches Russian art in a new direction. The consequence, of course, they paid for this because they have to resign from the academy. This was an initial step towards a completely new direction in art one that set the course for representation of contemporary Russian reality and history through a modern idiom. By the sheer determination and power of his dynamic personality, Kamskoy was able to unite these, and in fact, these were the best students in the academy, around a cause, thus breaking loose from the constraints of the academic monolith. Painting was his passion, and not surprisingly, he died with a paintbrush in his hand. The Moscow School of Painting, um, Moscow's rebellion, was through painting, not happenings. Graduates of the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture, Architecture, were less fettered by the academic doctrines because Moscovites led more natural, less restricted lives than they did in St. Petersburg, the courtly formality. And the diversity of its student body and the middle-class taste of its collectors and patrons allowed for flexibility in choice and interpretation of subject. The academic categor uh, categorization of painting by subject gave precedence at the academy to historical themes of antiquity. So it's very controlling, Following, followed by grand manner portraits, then genre, everyday life, landscape, and then still life. However, within the Moscow School, equal importance is earned by all five categories, and their boundaries are much more flexible, allowing artists to combine and group categories as treatment of subject matter. This was particularly appropriate for themes involving peasants a subject indelibly connected to the land and therefore dependent on landscape setting. Viridzvizhniki, the idea of traveling exhibitions, originated in Moscow and included St. Petersburg. It was an association of artists wishing to reach out to the diverse population in outlying regions outside the major cities, regions of the countryside, as a social crusade for educational purposes. Introduction of country folk to art with a Russian subject and addressing themes and subjects relevant to the, uh, those in the regions. This association lasted for 
from 1870 to 1920, which is quite a long time for any movement. And artists who joined this association were referred to as Pievizvizhniki, which, if we translate into English, will mean itinerants or wanderers. The Society of Traveling Exhibitions differed from Artists' Cooperative Society, which was formed in St. Petersburg in 1864, by promoting private initiative and profit. While profit from paintings within the Arts Cooperative was shared, the movement included two generations of artists. Well, understandably, 50 years for the movement, so two generations certainly will fit comfortably within those 50 years. The major founding members, it included many, many artists. Shishkin was one of them, but the major ones, those who really are the founding members were Grigory Nesayev, Alexei Sabrasov, Vladimir Shergut, Ilarion Pianishnikov, and Lev Kamin. The first two were of particular importance, so I will show paintings by those. Nesayedov to the development of Russian genre painting and everyday life, and Savrasa for his influence in landscape painting. Nesayedov's Reapers. The Pelidvizhniki group were committed to the representation of realistic fact, certainly is realistic in style and elevation of national consciousness. Subjects were to be of Russian origin, with the peasant as the positive hero. The interpretation of subject matter was more optimistic, replacing the harsh criticism of painting prior to the emancipation of 1861. So 70s, things become uh, much less intense and they relax and the, the peasant becomes the hero and they're not as critical. <clears throat> the composition of the Reapers is like a photo photograph from life, a genre scene recording life unfolding before our eyes. Distinction between categories is blurred. A genre painting blends with landscape. Is this landscape? Is this genre? Both categories are given equal importance by demand of the subject. The artist relies on a very dynamic composition with peasants arranged on a diagonal, but they are not leading your eye into the background, they're advancing towards you, the viewer. Hero, village funeral. This is an artist of the 60s and actually the, the 50s as well. So there's a lot more criticism in his works. Hero, the artist of the vi village funeral, along with Kanskoy, were founders of the Pelizvizhniki in St. Petersburg. And it was Kravskoy who summarized the mission of the itinerant association. He wrote, the artist should learn profound obedience to accept his dependence on instincts and needs of his people. He must find a way to harmonize his inner feelings and personal impulses with those of society. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. Pirov is committed to realism and is the leader among the critical realists of the 1850s and 60s. He subordinates composition and pictorial technique to content in order to convey an emotion, uh, an emotion of grief. There's a rhythm, there's a rhythm in the fur backs of the horse, the fur back of the widow, and the chap bow. And all of that works together with the monochromatic kind of the mournful harmony of grays and landscape. A characteristic silence, that stillness, pervades the landscape we've seen in other paintings earlier. The suggested drama of complete loneliness and isolation in grief doesn't ring true because it's a really a stylistic device. Because in reality, the <laughs> Excuse me? Someone didn't have the mute on. Oh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, in reality, village funerals involve participation of the entire village community. 
Masayevo, Zemstvo at lunch break. It's a governing, it's a present governing body in the regions, in the villages. That's Zemstvo. It's composed like a photograph. It's a snap, snapshot of reality with portraits, likenesses of its subjects. In fact, work to use portraits of peasants. It's the incidental details which reveal social divisiveness of the group. Peasants out of doors, seated on a bench, sweeting a very simple repast. While within the house, seen through an open window, you see a woman, a maid, and she's either cleaning up after the meal or preparing to set the table. But the table is obviously set with, we can see silver, we can see porcelain, we can see a white tablecloth. The division of the two social classes are visibly separated by the wall against which all of the peasants are arranged. Grigori Nasiriadov's The Staker, a monumental figure brought to the immediate foreground, occupying the entire format of the canvas. The figure of the Stoker, monument, monumental figure of the Stoker, takes up the entire format of the picture and is elevated to the status of a hero. The intense heat of the furnace illuminates the figure in a vibrant red, glowing with the intensity of the furnace. Red pulsate with heat advancing the figure even closer to the viewer. A genre painting, yet a portrait of a very specific man whose name we do not know. The drowned girl, Hero. Pessimism. Pessimism of the 60s is still there. It's poignant, melancholy scene that addresses the theme of isolation and loneliness, loneliness in a big city. This painting inaugurates Kirov's natural style. A corpse of a woman, the result of suicide, is juxtaposed against the frozen figure of the policeman, who in the early hours of morning has found her, having found her, sits quietly, inviting viewer, viewer to join him in contemplating the unalterable tragedy. The schumato blurred Moscow skyline looms in the distance, a reminder to a yet unaware city lost in its early morning slumber of its hopeful ability in the unfolded tragedy. Drama and mood are supported by composition, overall color harmony, and juxtaposition of the sleeping city blurred in Spumato with the alienated girl. Transkoi. Portrait of Nina Maisev. We have a name, Nina Maisev. The other is the, the earlier <laughs> There's a very strong ringing sound. Yes, yes, Maria, I am interrupting a little bit. This is because people of our listeners uh, come in and unmute or something. Uh, I can control that, but we're having some difficulty hearing you. Uh, so you may need to speak closer or... All right. All right. I've moved the computer. Okay. Should I back up or should I continue? What would you like me to do? I, I'm not the per I'm hearing you well because I have a headset on. Um, so I think we, we could, we could hear you, Maria. It was just, we can hear better if you're closer to the mic. Okay. I'm really close here now. Can you hear me now? Good. Okay. We feel we feel very close to you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I want to remind everyone else to make sure they are muted because that introduces other sounds that are confusing. Yes, okay. there's a ringing sound. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, should I go over this one? Vasily Pirov, The Drowned Girl. Pessimism of the 1860s pervades the poignant melancholy scene that addresses the theme of isolation and loneliness of a big city. This painting inaugurates Pirov's mature style. A corpse of a woman, result of suicide, is juxtaposed against the frozen figure of the policeman, who in the early hours of morning, having found her, sits quietly inviting viewer to join him 
in contemplating the unalterable tragedy. The spumato blurred Moscow skyline looms in the distance, a reminder to a yet unaware city lost in its early morning slumber of its cultural ability in the unfold of tragedy. Drama and mood are supported by composition, overall color harmony, which is very important to uh, Kittle, and juxtaposition of a sleeping city with an alienated figure. Tomskoy. Two portraits of a peasant, one with a name. The other one is in a way could be called a genre portrait. We do not have a name to put to this particular work. That's the one on the right. Tomskoy is well known for his portraits of profound psychological force. And the two portraits projected on the screen are a part of a series of portraits which was commissioned uh, for paintings of peasants. So now there's a real interest in that subject. And while the man with the clutch is a genre portrait, very much like the stoker, the peasant in Mina Maesev is a true portrait because it's of a specific man who has a name. Tamsko is well known for his portraits painted in a style characterized by limited range of color. And that is certainly true of the one on the right. However, the portrait on the left of Mina, which is later, uh, has a warm color palette offset by blues. So he is beginning to introduce a lot more color. But what is of particular significance in this uh, particular work is the textures of the painting, the texture of the hair, the beard, the sun burnt face are rendered by a very expressive brush stroke, one which would not have been appreciated by the Academy because they liked smooth surfaces. Well, in fact, the actual brush stroke creates and accentuates the textures uh, that he suggests with light effects and with Color. In 1863, Tanskoy established a school of drawing of the Society for the Encouragement of Artists in St. Petersburg, which attracted a very, very large group of people, but not just artists. Writers came uh, to uh, observe and perhaps learn to paint, composers and intelligentsia at large. Now landscape. Savrasov, the rye field. Savrasov looms large in the development of Russian realistic landscape, and particularly when painted out of doors. He observes light out of doors. It's all about atmosphere. It's all about light. And he paints sometimes out of doors. This is a landscape of mood, which is rather a characteristic of Russian landscape. Uh, with emphasis on state of change in nature. As a graduate and eventually professor of Moscow College of Art, he is in the position to become a major source of inspiration for second generation itinerants and a significant contrib contributor to the abrams of economy. Sunset over the swamp, a luminous effect, one that we've already noticed in Soroka, pervades this painting with the reflection of light on this extremely still glass-like surface of the <clears throat> pools of water in the swamp. And this particular work, he demonstrates a mastery of atmospheric effect. He has a very low horizon, and you can see the very rather sensual effect of atmosphere in this painting. It's really moist and heavy with rain and um, this one is probably the painting that he is most well known for, called The Rooks Have Arrived. Painters of landscape of the first generation to his vision to group recorded familiar Russian landscape of mood and sensual experience. It's very important that sensual experience of nature. This is particularly true of Savlasa's Rooks Have Arrived. The painting announces spring, and with its color palette and light effects, 
great essential experience of the season. Following a vision of dreary winter skies and white carpeted landscape, color begins to appear. Peeking through the snow, snow turns to reflective pools of water as nature slowly awakens to spring. Fyodor Vasilyev, this is a remarkable artist. He was called the genius boy, was how Kamsko referred to this youth, whose life was cut short at age 23. A remarkable artist with great promise, whose landscape paintings record the rural countryside and life of the peasant. He in fact traveled for the four years of his active professional life. He traveled all over Russia, the north, the south, etc. By recording the prosaic details of the lives of the peasants, he immerses you into country life. He captures the emotional character of the Russian landscape. He's quite well known for his very exceptional treatment of atmosphere. In the short four years, he reached full maturity. And this is um, a comment that were made by Tom Skoy and other mature professional artists. And he matures in those four years in complexity of composition, holistic harmony, light and atmosphere. This painting is extremely modern. It's modern in use of color. It's modern in the gesture of the brush. He creates gestures, suggest, uses the gesture of the brush stroke and imparts his energy into it. Uh, but he suggests the texture of the trees, the leaves, the grass, the vegetation, the very modern way of constructing the painting. And also the composition is modern and in a way will introduce what we will develop that will be developed later on with Impressionism and other modern artists. And this is a sad painting, I would say, melancholy one. It's his last one. And in this particular painting, uh, he was in the Crimea and he was being treated for his tuberculosis because he dies from TB, tuberculosis. And it is in this painting, once again, the composition is quite um, suggestive and interesting because he works with diagonals, the road on the diagonal, picked up by the dark strip that takes you to the left, the diagonal that takes you to the trees, and then the lit area on the crest of the mountain, which takes you up further towards the sky, and there's a peak, just kind of a sense of hope, perhaps, in this work, but it's in monochrome. He's a master of monochromatic painting. Andre Kuinji, pardon me, Arhip Kuinji, on the Balaam Island, an island way in the north of Russia, which was a very important spiritual center. Um, <clears throat> this is the first painting to bring fame to the artist. Arhip was very much liked. He was appreciated in the West and in his own country. It impressed his fellow itineraries and was lauded by French critics. For exemplary achievement in, again, monochromatic use of rays, and then also that wonderful gentle pink uh, that you see in the sky. His primary concern was with light at different times of day, night, or seasons. Inspired by mirror-like reflective quality of light, he studied Sabrasov. Sabrasov's landscape dealt with landscapes did influence um, Arhipuinji. He stuns the art world with his novel approach to light. He exhibited regularly in Europe. He travels to Europe as many of the Russian artists did, where his paintings were acclaimed and participated in wanderers exhibitions in the 70s until about 1879 when he withdraws to move in his own very personal direction, experimenting with various techniques to achieve the effect of atmospheric light. In this painting, Cornfield, yep, 
This painting is a good example of his experimentation with techniques for best result in depiction of light achieved. And here what we have is really an effect of vibrancy of atmosphere, vibrating atmosphere. Again, very low horizon, which seems to be a preference. Ukrainian night, 1876. This work was acclaimed a masterpiece. It was lauded by French critics for the modern approach in rendering glowing effects of light. And in fact, stories were told how viewers, those who came to the exhibition to the, on the opening night, they would come to the side of the painting and try to peek behind it to see whether there was some sort of a light bulb behind the painting, which created that very intense and bright effect of light. He does another, as you can see, it's, it's almost a, a series because you have Ukrainian night, and then here you have sunset in the Ukraine, and it's very similar kind of village scene that he is using, except here there's a lot more light. He applies it in a very modern sort of way because almost in a patch like arrangement of shaded lit areas and this extreme brilliance accentuated by the white, uh, whitewash houses. Birch Grove. And many are familiar with this work because it is often represented in survey books on Russian art. It again received rave reviews. It astonished the art world with its modern technique. In suggesting depth, and a very strong contrast of light and shadow. Actually, I shouldn't say shadow, light and dark patches of color. Juxtaposition of intense color, alternating in flat patches of shaded shadow and bright light. And this is how he leads the eye into the background. In the foreground, dark, then you have the lit area, then you have some dark, then you have light, then you have dark, and it gradually takes you towards the background. Again, a very modern approach. Philippian, <clears throat> Cossacks writing a letter to the Sultan. This is probably the most versatile artist of the second generation to the recent venturing out to explore a large variety of subjects and scenes from portraiture to depiction of fairy tales, gleaming imaginative genre versions of history. Once again, the fusion or combination of different categories of painting. Begins his career in the ranks of the earlier generation of wanderers, matures in the rank of the second generation of wanderers, and then joins the advance of the circle, where his ideas and talent are put to the service of the creation of the new national art. In 1870s, <clears throat> I should go back. In 1870s, the Russian history painting was rid of academic restraints and free to rely on contemporary and personal interpretation of everyday life of the past, resulting in history painting through genre. This is history, but it's through genre and portraiture. Kozak's writing to the Sultan is a good example where Rivikin combines genre and history in an imaginative personal interpretation of a legendary response of the Zaporozh Kozaks in 1675 to an arrogant declaration sent by the Sultan Mahmoud IV to accept Turkish rule. Fiercely independent, the Cossacks respond immediately by composing a response full of contempt and ironic humor. The painting is more about the mutual pleasure in the composed response, which vibrates with uncontrollable laughter. Small wonder, the art historian Igor Grabat, upon seeing the painting, immediately labeled it a symphony of laughter. The progress on the painting was slow. It took 
It had been 13 years to complete this work because of the numerous figures for which he used portraits painted from professors at the Art Academy. It was purchased by Tsar Alexander III, one of the major supporters of the revival of native art and creation of a new national art. Vasily Surikov, Bayarina Morozova. This artist trained in St. Petersburg Academy. He joins the ranks of the second generation to Dvizhniki, transitioning from realism to a more modern style eventually, as he joins the Abramsky circle. Once again, history is interpreted through emphasis on genre. The artist records with a keen eye native Russian costumes. He studied them, he researched them. There were hundreds of drawings, sketches, preliminary paintings, studies of various peasants with focus on the costumes and on the arts and crafts. Embroideries, you can see that beautiful cloth on the shoulder of the Bayadin, the man dressed in red. Um, all of that carefully, carefully researched. For example, the scarf, this is one of the preliminary drawings, paintings actually, in preparation for the painting. In fact, you can, you can see the woman, she's standing to the right of the man in the walking next to the sled. Uh, she's wearing that scarf. Details emphasize momentary quality of the scene. In the individual reaction of the characters lining the street, the crowd, uh, reaction of the crowd to the sleigh carrying off by Yadina Morozova. Uh, who was an old believer uh, in a very defiant gesture to the mi modernization of church, modernizing church uh, reforms of patriarchy in the 17th century. So it's a historical painting and at the same time quite imaginative and treated through genre. I thought I'd include this one because it's quite a, it appropriately fits into the, uh, the lecture. Konstantin Makovsky, the painting at the Legion of Honor here in San Francisco, and probably or perhaps some of you have seen it. More than likely, many of you have seen it. An itinerant by affiliation, Makovsky, as had Surika Vedepin, pursued a revival of traditional Russian art and creation of a new national style. His large historic canvases reflect a meticulous reproduction, reproduction, reproduction of historic period themes and items brought together in an eclectic manner to create a traditional Russian setting of a pre-Petrine period before Peter the Great. However, the items, though individually authentically reproduced, in combination they, they do not reproduce uh, consistently an environment of historic, very specific period authenticity. He was a pupil of Propinian, he assimilates the masterful treatment of texture of his teacher, but in this particular painting, he is certainly demonstrating impressionistic techniques in his study or in the way he treats life in his painting. Vladimir Stasi was a major art and music critic of the second half of the 19th century. He was born in St. Petersburg and received a very fine education. While a student at the academy studying law, he developed his life's passion for music and art. Together with his friends, he would perform arias, romance songs, participate in plays, in concert. In fact, he has a very interesting the credo he sums up in his own words. He wrote, not to be born to be an artist, but to be of benefit to those who were. He begins his literary career as an art and music critic in 1847, writing short articles on painting, architecture, and music. Within two years, he had written 20 such articles, and they were published in Atsiechistvenir Zadiski Country Notes. 
Marxist journal, thus it related to the realist movement, which gave more freedom to artists interested in pursuit of national subjects. By 1860s, he be befriends participants of the revolt of the 14, giving support to their cause, and by the 70s, he embraces the Petit Vision group, the Wanderers, the Itinerant group. Because of this, his conviction that every nation should have its own national art. You can see a whole array here, you know, from middle age to uh, later years, uh, portraits of this uh, very remarkable individual. The Hippin portrait of Modest Mussorgsky. It's part of a large series of paintings of eminent Russians commissioned by Pritikov, a very prominent Moscow art collector. Um, and uh, this was divvied out to different artists. This the portrait of um, Mussorgsky was painted by Lyapin. And it was painted, in fact, he came to the hospital where the musician, the composer was dying, uh, and in fact was the painting that painted and the sitter was the alien um, composer who, in fact, um, it was very shortly before his death. It was at this time in St. Petersburg that Stasov became friends with Milan Balakir and Alexander Dargamushsky. Together, they formed a circle of lovers of Russian music, which later was joined by Mussorgsky, Alexander Baradin, another portrait, part of this group, uh, painted by Ryepin, another composer, Nikolai Dinsky Korsakov, and Cesar Cui, <clears throat> and formed the group thus of named the Mighty Bodych, a group committed to representation of Russian national idea music. The search for music with the national identity turned them to the study of Russian folklore and medieval Russian chant, which later found expression in music. Modest was an innovator of Russian music in the Romantic period, who strove to achieve a uniquely Russian musical identity. Often the deliberate defiance to establish conventions of Western music. Sasov not only wrote articles on their work, but actively took part in it, suggesting topics for operas and search for material and documentation for librettos. Portrait of Kritikov. Patronage of the arts in Moscow was comprised of considerably more diverse group of individuals, consisting both of nobility and merchant middle class. A major tribute should be made to this man. <clears throat> And I show you uh, him uh, by, in two portraits, one by Ilya Ryepin, the other one by Kanskoy. He was a businessman, entrepreneur, patron of the arts, collector, philanthropist, and he amassed a major collection of Russian art for which he built a gallery, which bears his name. It's there today. Initiator of fashion for collection of Russian works of art, he became a major player in cultivation of Russian national art. Nyestir, a member of the Brahms of the Circle, recounts that the Tiko would always manage to appear unannounced in his studio once the canvases were complete and stand silently for hours contemplating them and then end up purchasing several. Portrait of Sava Mamita reveals a very dynamic personality, full of vitality and energy. This is the man, the founder of the Abramson colony, which will, you know, which will be the subject of um, October's lecture. He's full of vitality, he's extremely energetic, and he's the one who motivated and drove the creative energy of the Abramson colony. The art colony was a think tank, generating ideas of those brought together within its orbit. And it consisted of 
artists, architects, philosophers, literary figures, historians, art historians, musicians, singers. The creative energy of these talented individuals culminated in the revivalization and cultivation of medieval and peasant arts and the creation of the Russian art with a national identity, which again, as I've mentioned, will be the subject in October. To quote Vasnitsov, we will only then contribute to the treasury of world art when we will direct all our energies toward the development of our native Russian art. That is, when we shall accomplish a total representation and expression of the beauty, power, and meaning of our native images of Russian nature and man, of our traditional way of life, our past, our dreams, our faith, and when we will be able to reflect through our national art, the eternal and the common.